Hi, everyone, and welcome to our study in the book of Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 1 today, and we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 5a. And uh, we're going to go as, as, as much as we can through, through each verse and parse it out as much as we can and drill down because I believe that it's important to understand the entirety of the book of Revelation and not just gloss through it and hit the high points, but get every facet that John was revealed and and explain it, explore it, drill down as far as we can understand it because it is a book that promises blessing to us, to those who read it and hear it and obey it. And so it's a power-packed book, and so I don't want to rush through things, so we're going to take our time through this. So what I've entitled this message is The God of Grace and Peace Who Gives Us purpose. The God of grace and peace who gives us purpose. And again, we'll just be studying about one and a half verses today. So in this section of the book of Revelation, the churches are being greeted by the Lord himself and being greeted by John, obviously, as well. And what this part of the book of Revelation is doing is helping the believers understand what God has done for them, who they are in Christ, what their purpose is, before explaining the rest of the book of Revelation. Because it will be important for those believers living at that time in the future who are actually going to undergo um, you know, that, that awful period of time called the tribulation period. This is basically a survival manual for them. And it's there to encourage them, to help them through that period of time. And it also can help us as well in our period of time. We go through trials and tribulations, not at the level of the, of the tribulation period, obviously, but we go through life and there's a lot of difficulties in life, no doubt about that. And so what John is doing in the greeting to the churches here is to give them a sense of purpose, a sense of identity of who they are and what God has done for them that will help them through the trials and tribulations of life. And so, you know, most people go through life and they, they, they see life as just one big rapid fire series of, of, of events and, and they leave us helpless and hopeless and kind of leave us meaningless what happened. And that's not how life is to be interpreted. Life is to be ter- interpreted by, by a biblical worldview and to understand that God is, is doing something in our lives and doing something in the world to bring about the Messiah to rule and reign in his kingdom, to bring about salvations, and to help grow us as well. But if you see life as just this endless series of events that are meaningless, well, your life will be absent of divine purpose and meaning. And a lot of Christians, unfortunately, go through that. Obviously, unbelievers go through this this because they do not know what their life means. So when you look at this section, you're going to discover what your identity is. You're going to discover your purpose uh, in life, and once you, once you establish that and realize what God has done and what he's wanting out of us, it makes the mundane things of life um, have a deeper kind of dimension to them. It, it, it gives purpose to even the, the simple things in life. And so none of us want to go through life uh, in a meaningless state. We want to know what God's will for our life is. And we want to glorify God in all what we do, but we definitely want to use the time, talent, and gifts and treasures that God has given us to answer the call on our lives for service and what that specific service should be and what he wants us to do. So that's kind of the angle we're going to look at today. And so let me give you the setting. Obviously, we're in the introduction to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And again, it's, it's given to believers that despite the evil world that they live in, that, that God is going to do something about it. He's going to rectify the situation. He's going to destroy evil and purge out sin from this world by the cataclysmic events in the tribulation and eventually set up his kingdom with his son to rule and reign forever um, with a perfect government. And so that's kind of the outset of the whole reason that the book of Revelation has written is that the purging of evil, justice must be served, evil, evil must be dealt with once and for all. 
And, and so with that being said, we know that God is promising justice. And therefore, that gives us uh, hope in our lives, that, give us per- that gives us purpose, and that all is not lost. That the things this life takes away from us, we will get back. The injustice that's done to us will be made right one day by the Lord. And so that increases our faith. That helps us to believe uh, that the Lord is going to write all these things for us. And so we can trust him for that. And so this future, this future judgment that the book of Revelation talks about is to give the believer encouragement, to give them hope, to keep them moving forward in the face of opposition, in the face of evil, in the face of persecution. And to tell the believer, your life is not meaningless. Even though this world will tell you that, even though you might feel that way, or tell that this world might tell you you're nothing um, because you're a believer in the Messiah or whatnot. Um, God is saying something different. And it's important for us to pay attention to what he says and that our life has meaning and purpose. So let's start with verse 4. And the first point we want to discover is this, that the Lord gives us grace and truth for our purpose. Now that's important. For, for us to know what we're, we're here for, for us to know what our mission is for the Lord, for us to know what he wants of us, By the Lord's grace and truth that he gives to us, that then gives us purpose. That gives our lives purpose. And so in verse 4, it says this, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. And Asia obviously would be Turkey, modern-day Turkey today. It was called Asia Minor at that point. And so seven of the churches that he's going to specifically give this message to are in the area of Turkey. And so then he says, grace to you. Now, everybody knows what grace is. It's unmerited favor. And and really what it's saying is it's really God's attitude attitude towards unbelievers and even lost humanity. That despite our rebellion, despite our rejection of him, God still reaches out to us to offer grace and mercy. And so grace is, is something that we don't deserve, but God still offers it. It also can be looked at as as this, that God initiates the relationship. That even though we don't naturally want a relationship with God, that he initiates the relationship and he calls us to a relationship with him to reestablish that which was lost. Uh, Our sin nature estranges us from God. It separates us from God. And that sin nature causes spiritual deadness in us. Now what God does is he reaches towards us and calls us back to him. And then you and I have the free will to respond to that or to reject that call. But he does that to everybody. He makes the call available to everybody. Not all will come, but for the few that will, it's worth it. And so God extends that grace to all humanity. So that being the case, that's the foundation of our purpose in life, our meaning in life, is that God cares for so much that despite us being in rebellion, despite us having a sin nature and sinning against him, this holy God still wants a relationship with us and he has made provision for us through his son Jesus Christ in order to have that relationship with us. So that's the basis of our meaning in life is that God values us that much to sacrifice his own son for us. So that that tells us a lot about how God feels about us and how much he loves us. He values that much uh, all his his creatures. But anyway, it goes on and says, grace to you and peace. Now, the peace here is probably, in the Greek, it's not shalom because shalom would be Hebrew, but it's probably referring to the, the Hebrew concept of shalom. So grace and peace. So with shalom... Uh, in the Hebrew culture, this again is relationship with God by his grace that he offers not only to believers, but unbelievers as well. It's the peace that God offers through the provision of his son, that through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, that you and I can have peace with God. And so since John is talking to the seven churches, churches he's talking to believers so god then extends his grace and peace to those 
uh, who initially have received it in salvation, but also now receive it in their sanctification as well. It's that harmony with God. That is the basis of our lives. That is the basis of our meaning in life. And shalom, when you look at it in the Hebrew context, it signifies a sense of well-being and harmony between both parties, a completeness, a wholeness, a peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility. All these words go into shalom, fullness, rest, harmony, um, absence of agitation, no discord, a state of calm without any anxiety or stress. I mean, that is all and the definition of shalom. And that's what uh, John is greeting the churches with, grace and shalom. The hostility is now over between God and those who believe in his son. There is no hostility, just peace, just shalom. And so, therefore, we work from that truth. We work from that foundation that we do have peace with God. And so that's how we understand what our purposes in life are. So to make the application for the rest of the book of Revelation, you know, we see these impending judgments. We see the impending judgments that are going to come upon the world. And therefore, the grace and shalom or peace that we have received by coming to faith in Jesus Christ prevents us from these impending judgments. We will not be condemned by the judgments of the tribulation, nor the judgments of the lake of fire. And so what that's supposed to do is, is bring us the, the, the security and peace and safety of knowing that we are not under the wrath of God any longer. Jesus took that wrath. And so that, that makes perfect sense because when you study the book of Revelation, it's all, uh, most of it's all wrath. There's a lot of grace and mercy sprinkled in, but it's a lot of judgments, no doubt about that. But rest assured, none of these judgments will come upon you and I because of coming to faith in Messiah. And because of that, that grace and shalom, that's one of the foundations for the pre-tribulational rapture that will be raptured prior to the tribulation because the whole tribulation, all seven years, is condemnation and judgment. And so there's a, a sense of comfort in that. And then it continues on in verse 4. It says this, From him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, when that reference you see being made by John, it is referring to the Father, and he's referring to the Father as Yahweh, obviously. All three persons of the Godhead are Yahweh. But in this section, he's going to go through the Trinity here. So all facets of the, all personhoods of the Trinity are mentioned here. And so the one who is and was and is to come, he's referencing to the Father being Yahweh. And if you ever look at the, the word Yahweh in the Paleo-Hebrew, the original Hebrew, the way they used to write, what you will notice that the Hebrew says something because uh, it's a pictorial um, language. Um, and, and if you look at the Paleo-Hebrew, it'll say, hand, behold, nail, behold. So it's like embedded in Yahweh's letters, the Tetragrammaton, the fact that Yahweh one day, you, you look at the nail and then you look at, the, at his hands because the nail is going to go through his hands. So it, it's right there in his name in the Paleo Hebrew, which is absolutely amazing. So it just shows you that how much God's willing to sacrifice for us. And anyway, the, this, this reference obviously points to when Moses asked about God, who do I say is sending me? He says, I am. And that's what who is, who was, and who is to come is referring to. It's referring to the great I am, Yahweh. And Yahweh obviously is the Lord of all time and eternity. God is the eternal one. And so um, that's what Yahweh means. It means I am, right? And so, in the English, it sounds like a statement in the present tense, but in the Hebrew, uh, the I am, it contains all tenses, past, present, and future. And so, 
So the, the first person in the Trinity greets the churches, and now he's going to move into the um, to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, greeting the churches. So we continue in verse 4, and it says this, And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now the seven spirits are the full manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The seven represents completeness or perfection. Anytime you see the, 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 the term or the number seven, it means completeness and perfection. And uh, you can see this in Zechariah 4, 2 through 7 about the lampstands. And, in, and then obviously in, in Isaiah 11, 2, you see the sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The, or, the, or what we would call the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. And obviously represented by a menorah, the seven branch menorah, which is the fullness of the Spirit. Now Messiah had the fullness of, this, of the Spirit. So anyway, it's, it's a direct reference to the Holy Spirit, obviously in greeting the churches as well. And then it moves into the second person of the Trinity greeting the churches, verse 5, and it says this, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Now, this is, again, referring to the second person of the Trinity, the Messiah. And notice that it says that the Messiah is the faithful witness or the faithful martyr. And the faithful martyr is that Jesus Christ went to a cross and died for our sins. And so he's faithful in obedience to God in making the sacrifice for us. And that is also his martyrdom for us, for our salvation. And that's why he's called the faithful witness. So I want you to notice then and all three persons of the Godhead are involved in the greeting of the churches. It is the triune God that is greeting the churches, and offering grace and shalom to the churches. Now, this idea of the faithful witness, let me go back to that just a little bit. It's an allusion or, or reference to Psalm 89. Uh, you can see verse 27, verse 37, and it says, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth, and his throne shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. And so, like the moon is a faithful witness, it tells it's, it, to the Hebrews that was their calendar. They, they, they went on the lunar calendar. And the moon was a faithful witness of when the times and seasons came. And he's Psalm 89 and John are trying to reference the fact that Messiah is like that. He is a faithful witness. He tells you the signs of the times. He tells you what's going on. And in the book of Revelation, he explains what the future is going to look like. He explains how things will look, the signs of the times, drawing near to this awful period of time. And so he's a faithful witness to that as well. And, and with that being said, you know, Messiah has threefold, a threefold role. Um, he played the role as the prophet when he was here at the first coming. And now he plays the role as the high priest. And eventually, what the book of Revelation is trying to say is that he will eventually play the role as king in the messianic kingdom. And so basically what Messiah says is true and reliable. And he proved he was true and reliable on earth. And now what he says to John is true and reliable. And sometimes it's hard to to accept what the book of Revelation says. There's a lot of bad things in there. And a lot of people they try to avoid the book of Revelation because it scares them. They don't like the things being said in there. But as hard as it is to accept it, we must accept it because Jesus is the faithful witness. He is telling us how things are going to go down and what's going to go down. And so it's important for us to push past our fear to faith. And even some of the things that are going to be said in the book of Revelation are going to be so outstanding, so, so unbelievable that it will take an incredible amount of faith on our part to believe it. Um, and so that's why the book of Revelation requires maturity. It requires deep roots for the individual because of the things that are going to be said in it. And so hopefully we've put our roots down deep and we're mature enough to accept the things that it says about where our world is going. So then in verse 5, it says that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Now, the ancient rabbis called Yahweh himself the firstborn of the world. 
And the rabbis also use firstborn as a messianic title. So if you look at Psalm 89, uh, again, uh, another reference to it, it says that Yahweh says that he will make the son his firstborn, the highest of the kings. And so this speaks of Jesus' standing as the preeminent among all beings, that he is first in priority. It's not like the Jehovah Witness say, well, Jesus was uh, 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 the first of all creation. Uh, no, no, Jesus has preeminence over all creation. He is the God-man. He is the eternal one. He is the second person of the Trinity. And he took on that additional nature and followed, followed the Father in obedience as a human being and then is exalted because of his, his obedience as a human being. So we've got to remember, Jesus has two natures. He is God and he is also man. And therefore, then when he is resurrected, he is called the firstborn of the dead. He, has, he is the preeminent one he is, uh, among all his, his believers, obviously. And so he is the first one to receive a resurrected body. He conquered death and his life produces life. It's kind of the idea of life out of death because he is life. And so these items are now passed and one thing remains to be filled. And that's, this is what John goes into saying. <clears throat> and he goes, in, in, continuing on in verse 5, it says, And the ruler uh, over the kings of the earth. So Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. That's past. He's already accomplished that. And, and what awaits is him being the ruler over the kings of the earth. He, is not, he doesn't have that position yet. And like we said, that's the third position of Jesus reigning and ruling as king. He has played the role of the prophet. He has played the role of the priest. Currently, right now, he's our high priest. And then eventually when he comes back, he will play the role as king. And so those, those are the three offices of the Messiah. They're, they, um, you can see them as being simultaneous, no doubt about that, but definitely an emphasis on him being a prophet, um, the God-man prophet in the first coming. Right now, the, the, inter, the interval between his ascension and his return uh, at the rapture, he's now playing a significant role as the high priest of Melchizedek and then a lady around the messianic king and we ushers in the kingdom. So um, most, most people would see it as three separate time periods where these three offices are being kept by the Messiah. Not so much simultaneously, even though you could say that, but having their roles being, being accomplished in different time periods is the idea. Well, anyway, as you study the book of Revelation, it's going to be important to notice that Revelation has an earthly focus on the kingship of the Messiah. That Messiah is the rightful heir to be king over the planet. He is the rightful heir uh, over David's line to be uh, on David's throne and to rule the world. So we have a twofold understanding of things about Jesus ruling and reigning. He has the right to rule because he's the second Adam and overcome any temptation, and therefore, because of his sacrifice, he is given the scroll, and that scroll in the book of Revelation represents the title deed to the earth. He is, as the second Adam, the, the second king that did not fail. Adam, our first king, failed. Our second king did not, so therefore, he has the right to rule the entire planet. And, and to, to add to that, he is the rightful heir of David's throne. And therefore, he will rule this planet from David's earthly throne in Jerusalem during the Messianic age. So that's when we say he has an earthly focus, not so much a heavenly focus, is because Jesus comes back here on earth to rule and reign the earth from David's throne. So it's a future reference. The kingdom is not a spiritual kingdom like people want to make it out to be. It is a literal kingdom. It cannot be ushered in by human beings. It has to be ushered in by the God-man, Messiah, at the second coming. And that's what, I, again, we want to explore that just a little bit because there's so many people that misunderstand that. You have people of the New Apostolic Reformation. You have people that believe in the dominionism. 
kingdom now theology, and they think that they're going to usher in the kingdom without Jesus. And that's ludicrous. That's not what the scriptures talk about. Or then you have other people that allegorize the kingdom or believe there's no kingdom at all. That's all a misunderstanding of the kingdom. The kingdom is a literal kingdom. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. And then John is the first one that tells you how long the earthly kingdom will go until uh, you move into eternity. And it's for a 1,000 year period. And then it will continue on after that in eternity. But nonetheless, uh, the specifics are made, and because it's so specific, it cannot be allegor allegorized or spiritualized. It is a literal kingdom. An application to what we're experiencing in this world and why the book of Revelation and the judgments are necessary is because when God gave man the authority over this planet and the sovereignty to, to, to rule over this planet, man ultimately fa has failed, and man has been put in every type of scenario, every situation, and man simply cannot rule effectively. Because of his sin nature and his bent towards evil, uh, man's rule continues to fail. And that's why the Messiah has to come back as the God-man to rule and reign, a perfect ruler, a just and righteous ruler. And so what's happening now uh, in our world today, and has happened for thousands of years, is that man... In order, in, instead of submitting to the rulership of God over man and then coming underneath God in his rulership, man has been independent of God. He has not wanted God to rule over him. And so just like Adam and Eve did, they decided to be their own rulers, to make up the rules as they go, to, be, to become a God unto themselves. That's what man has done. And therefore, man rules without any regard so much for God and his rules. They don't, see, they don't see that there's a higher authority. You know, if you look at China, or if you look at Russia, or if you look at the left, or if you look at um, other countries, they don't see that they serve God. They don't see that they're responsible for implementing His, his ways, His principles, His values. You know, and so therefore they just make up their rules as they go. And that's what you're seeing here in America as well. We have people and politicians that are just making up rules, not according to the Bible, not according to biblical values and morals, but according to their own, according to man's ways, right? And so they have been challenging Christ's right to rule. The parable that he told the religious leaders of Israel, that they said uh, that the, the, the king sent his son, and they said, we will not have this man to rule over us. Well, that is fitting not only for the religious leaders of that day, but also today. Human beings do not want Christ to rule. Now, we do as believers, but we're talking about lost humanity. And they have been shaking their fist in front of God for a long, long time. So when Christ comes back, what he will do then is exercise his right as king over all the kings of the earth. And that's what we look forward to seeing one day. But the application before we move on, um, we got to make some personal application. This truth that God gives me grace, he gives me shalom, and that he's going to rule and reign and right all the wrongs in our lives, that helps us to have purpose. That, help, that helps us to have meaning. That even though all the wrongs and, 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 and bad things that happen to us, that ultimately God's going to make things right even in our own personal lives. Because God is showing his character. He's a, 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 a God who, who extends grace and shalom to us. And therefore loves us and values us and will make things right. And he will do what he says he will do for us. We can, we can, we can trust him for that because he's the faithful witness, right? And you can even see in John 1.17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that's what's come to you and I through the Messiah. And so what we need to understand is that the triune God is a God of relationship. He's a God of love. And he wants to bring his, his, his creatures back to him. His, his human creatures that he created. And many of them obviously have rebelled. We, we, we were in rebellion before we came to faith in Christ. 
but God is love and extends that offer to his creatures to come back. But he also is a God that's holy and just. And if those creatures don't come back to him, if humanity doesn't come back to them, they leave him with no choice other than the judgments that you see in the book of Revelation. And so God is fair, he is just, he is holy, he's good, he's loving, gracious, and merciful. And so that's the balanced view that you have to see of God. And that's what the book of Revelation is trying to do. It is balancing out uh, the goodness of God, the mercy and grace of God, and the judgment of God, and the holiness and, ju and justice. So on a personal level, in how you and I relate to God, he is saying that you don't perform for me, that my son performed for you. And you relate to me based on grace. You relate to me based on my love. You relate to me based on my mercy. You don't relate to me on law keeping because you can't keep the law. That was the whole point of the Messiah. You relate to God on his grace and shalom that he gives to us through Jesus Christ. Now, why is that important? Because if you don't understand that, that that is the basis in which you relate to God, you will gravitate to relating to a distorted view of God. You will relate to him in trying to keep law. And even believers can, can fall into this trap. They can get saved, but then they fall into their relationship as a law keeping with God and checking off boxes and whatnot. Now there's no doubt God wants us to obey. He desires us to obey. But we, we do that out of love. We do that out of his grace and mercy. We want to obey him. But if you're just simply obeying God because you're doing a checklist and you, there's really no love relationship, no grace, no mercy, then, then you're not relating to God properly. And in fact, what, that ha what happens to us is we can start getting a distorted view of God. How so? Well, instead of seeing God as merciful, gracious, and loving, and values us and wants us to be obedient, you'll see God as a condemner. You will see God as one who wants to punish you. You will see God as one who, who keeps uh, you know, looking at your life and says you're a failure and, and you know, you're, you're going to get very discouraged with that view of God because the law does what? The law kills. And so when you relate to God on law, um, it's going to have its effect on you spiritually. And as you can see, the triune God is relating to us on grace and shalom. Now, let me give you an example of that. What, what do I mean by that? Well, it's like what I told our congregation one time in understanding this. Let's say you have a problem. Whatever the problem is, a sinful problem, and you can't break away from that sin. A law keeper type of Christian will say, well, I'm just going to give my best effort. I'm going to give my old college try. I'm going to try to overcome this sin by my own efforts, by the rule keeping in my life, and hopefully I will be able to overcome by the rule keeping. That, that, that'll end in failure because that's self-effort. If you try to overcome sin by grace and mercy and a relationship with God, then that's what succeeds. So that's what overcomes. Now, if I relate to God on that, then at that point, then I'm working in relationship with him that someone that's for me, wants me to succeed, wants me to overcome my sin, and provides the tools necessary for me to overcome. And that person has a very good chance of, of, of getting victory over that particular sin. The one that's keeping the law is not using the tools of God that God gives them. They're just simply law keeping. And they have no help. There is no supernatural help in law keeping. And so with that being said, that's the contrast you, we have to understand as believers. So let's drill down a little further. When you start keeping law and you relate to God based on law and not grace and shalom, mercy, you start developing distorted images of God. The distortion of him will start happening because you will allow other things to creep in and you won't have a clear picture of who God is. And our images of God, you know, um, sometimes derive from, from different sources, but they won't match 
what the Bible says about God. And you can affirm that you believe in God and you believe in God's love and grace. But again, if we really looked at our behavior, our behavior would tell, tell us what we really believe about God. I mean, some people might have images of God that he's an abusive bully. Uh, other people might have images of God that, you know, he's just uncaring and unloving and doesn't care about them. That does make an impact on you if you have a distortion like that. It will factor into your behavior. And so let me give you an illustration of what distortions do to people. I was reading this illustration a while back in a book, and it, and it said that there was a woman going through a divorce um, because obviously her husband had left her, and she was kind of in a time of desperation. She was in a lot of pain, great loss, sad and happy, obviously, in great need, right? And she wanted to pour out her heart to God. She wanted to pour out, pour out all her feelings and frustrations and everything so that she wouldn't feel alone. And so perhaps that she could get more strength and help from him, but she just simply couldn't do it. You see, because her distortion of God was that she feared God in an unhealthy way. Now, the scripture says to fear God, but it's a, a reverential awe. But she feared him. She was terrified of God. And the idea is that she had a distorted perception of God based on something from her past or whatever. And so she, her feelings were drumming up inside of her and she, would, she was asking God, why are you allowing this misery? Again, that was coming from a wrong perception. God wasn't the one who caused the divorce. It was her husband, not God. But yet she was blaming God. And, and if you... You, you looked any further in her life, well, growing up, the central figure in her life was a domineering and very harsh father. And this, this guy kept his wife and kids terrified of his anger, right? So as a little girl, she, she grew up like this, and she, we a lot of times get our images of God from our parents. And so as a little girl, she learned to be compliant, to withdraw, to not show her emotions, Never tell people how she felt. Um, she saw what was happening to her brothers when someone spoke up and they were immediately shut down. And so what happened is she transferred that perception onto God. She began to see God the same way, that he's harsh and domineering. She's terrified of his anger. And so she just simply wants to withdraw from God, be compliant, but never really say anything how she feels to God. Never want, never able to pour herself out to God. And so you can see how a distortion of God would affect somebody. So she didn't want to go to God. She saw God as condemning and dangerous, basically. Um, and she's a Christian. She believed. But because of distorted thinking, she didn't really have a deep connection with the Lord and couldn't get the help that she really needed from him. Uh, I, that, that kind of distortion you can see in the parable of the talents. You remember the guy who went and buried his talent? And then when Jesus comes to settle accounts, the guy who buried his talent actually explains how he had a distorted view of the master, of the Messiah. Remember what he says? He says, I knew you were a hard man, gathering where you don't scatter seed and, and reaping where you haven't sown. Now, the fact that he accused the master of that shows you that he had a distorted view of the master. That wasn't true of the master, but yet that was in his head. And because of that distortion, he was afraid of the master because he says, I was afraid. He goes and buries his talent. Well, that's what a lot of people do. Because they don't see the triune God as, as, the, as the scriptures portray him, they get distortions of God and it affects their behavior. And they don't become all that God wants of them. They don't follow him properly. They don't do the mission they have uh, set before them that God has laid out for them. It affects them. It affects their behavior. So what I want to do at this point, I want to go through as an application the general distortions of God that people have. I've seen this over the years in counseling um, and Quite frankly, it, it saddens my heart to see it because people don't have a biblical view of God. 
And that's what the book of Revelation is trying to establish with the churches. You have to see God in the proper light in order to endure and, and understand the reality in which you live in. And so, again, these distortions come from like painful, painful issues in our past. They come from what we learned from our families or just simply things that we made up and experienced. And so we created these distortions. And some of these distortions are the following. There's the God that's powerless. They believe in God. This, this could be a believer, but, but God doesn't do any power for you. He does, he's impotent. He can't do anything. And so they doubt God's omnipotence. And so what do they do? They seek their own power. Then there's those who believe that God doesn't provide for anything. He, 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 lacks, he lacks provision, and he doesn't provide the needs for people. And so they have that view of God. Then they have a view of God, the unknowing God, and that this, this God doesn't have the answers that you're looking for, so why go to him? You better seek wisdom on your own. You know, and that, that, that's obviously a distortion. And then there's the God that people create, the never there for you God. That yes, they believe in Jesus and God and, and, and whatnot, but he's not available for them. Uh, he never has been and never will be. So they end up getting their own support in life to cope with life instead of going to God. Then there's the critical God that people have in their minds, and this is the kind of God you can never please him. Again, this comes from legalism, trying to relate to God on law, and so they see God as overbearing. Um, you know, you just can't please him. Um, and so they don't even sometimes even try. Um, so they give up or, or they run themselves ragged trying to, to please God. Do you understand that because you come to faith in Messiah, you do please God? You already please him. He is very well pleased with you, and therefore you're accepted. Now, approval and acceptance are two different things. Appro he may not approve of behavior, but he does accept you. He is pleased that you've come to faith in the Messiah. And so again, you, it comes back to, you know, do I relate to God on law or do I relate to God on my relationship with him? And that's, that's how people start having distortions is because they relate to God in an unbiblical way. So let's continue in some of these distortions of God. Then there's the no protection God, that he's, he's not a source of security or protection. And then there's the other God uh, that he's a deist God, that he's disconnected from what you and I are doing. He's not with us in hard circumstances. He's unavailable, uninvolved. Um, and then there's the angry God. Some people have a vision of God as being the angry God. Now, we do know that God is angry at sin, but if you've come to faith in him, you're under no condemnation and he's not angry with you. But some people say, well, uh, I know he, he was supposed to love me, but I'm sure he doesn't like me, that he's irritated with me. And so they don't feel safe with God. And so they, are, they never really open up to God. Again, that's a distortion. That's a distortion. And that, that affects so many things. It affects how they relate to God, how they pray, how they serve, how they deal with other believers. It, it really affects them. And so what we have to make sure is that we don't have a distorted view of God. So let me end with this illustration. A master martial artist asked one time the famous Bruce Lee to teach him everything he knew about martial arts. Bruce held up two cups, both filled with liquid. The first cup, said Bruce, represents all of your knowledge about martial arts. The second cup represents all of my knowledge about martial arts. If you want to fill your cup with my knowledge, you must first empty your cup of your knowledge. Now, the, the application of that is pretty obvious. That what God is saying and explaining to us about what he has done for us, how he cares for us, is, is, needs to be put inside of us. But in order to be put inside of us, we have to get rid of the distortions about God. That anything that distorts our image of God uh, needs to come out of us. 
And see, that's been the problem for a lot of us is that we're living with a synchronistic view of God, a view of, from scripture, but then also blending it with a view that we've learned from our family, from our experiences, from our trauma, from our hurts and our pains of life. And we actually start blending the two together so we don't really have a good, accurate picture of God. And so I think that advice is pretty good. You've got to take out what's not true about God and you've got to put in you what is true about God. The way to do that is first identify if you have any distortions about God, if you see him in the wrong light. And once you can do that, you can, you can expel that with the truth. And at that point then, John and what he's trying to do can happen to you. He's preparing his readers for what they're going to see God do. And in order to see properly what God is about to do in the book of Revelation, you have to have a biblical view of God. Otherwise, you will misinterpret why the judgments are happening. You will see God as this, 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 this angry God that just wants to destroy humanity. And that's not what's happening. It's a, it's a position that God is taking because humanity has ran out of options. They have spurned his grace and mercy. They have rejected his son, and the time is up. God has extended mercy and grace to humanity, and now there is no more left. And so you have to see these things in the proper light. And the only way to do it is to have a biblical view of God. So join us next time as we continue to study the book of Revelation. Again, we're going to take our time through it. And uh, we're going to study more of chapter 1 next time. And we're going to look at what God has done for us, the positions he's given us, and what he expects out of us. Um, and again, this is all preparatory before we read the book of Revelation in chapter 6 through 19. You're going to see a lot of prep work in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, getting us prepared to look at the judgments in the book of Revelation. So, um, so we're going to be in chapter 1 next time and continue to study. And I pray that the Lord continues to bless you as you study this, this difficult book. But once you get in it, you will realize it's, it's not that difficult if you just understand the background to it. So I'm glad you're with us and watch us next time, okay? God bless you. We'll see you next time.